Good morning. Are we uh, ready to worship the God of heaven and earth? <laughs> Stand if you're able, or if you'd like, worship the Lord. Lord, we just do want to praise you all day long, Father. Make that the joy of our heart. Father, you give us so much, and we give you so little. And Father, we're thankful that you love us unconditionally. And we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike and the guys. And and Susan in the back as well. Good morning, everyone. So good to be with you. Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Uh, today, we're finishing off chapter 6 of the uh, Gospel of Matthew. This is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. So today's actually a little bit of a continuation from last week, and I'll explain more about that here in just a moment. But this is God's Word to us this morning, Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves Treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own. Father God, may you honor the reading of your word today with hearing, with understanding. Lord, and I pray today especially for application. May we take your word to heart, Lord God, through the work of your Holy Spirit, impressing upon our minds, imprinting our hearts with a deeper trust in you so that the cares of this world, the worries of this life will fade into the background and not consume us, not eat us away from within, not overwhelm our minds with worry and anxiety and fear and trepidation and all the things that go with that. Lord, we pray for release from these things through the power of trusting in you, your goodness, your presence, your power, and your word. Lord, I pray in these moments for those gathered here, those who are watching online now, and even at a later moment, I pray, Lord, for your spirit to work powerfully through your word. And yes, even through my words, which I pray do not get in the way of your message, Lord God, as always. Lord, these things we pray for the glory of your son Jesus and his power to save his power to redeem, his power to renew, his power to give us the life that is truly life as we follow him. And it's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, your Son, O oh Father God, that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
and a very special welcome to those joining with us in our live stream today. We're so glad that you are a part of the Oak Park family. Please remember that you can text in comments or questions, prayer praises or prayer requests. We invite you to interact with the service, especially the sermon time. You can text those things in to 805-481-7092. We look forward to hearing from you. If you are contacting us for the first time and we don't have a name to associate with your number, please text in your name. We'd love to get to know you uh, on a deeper level so we can help you with your spiritual journey. But thanks for, uh, thanks for being with us today. As I said, this is a little bit of a continuation from last week's message. Last week, we looked at the first part of Matthew 6, which is where Jesus was laying out the scope of what it means to not live a life of religiosity, of just following rules or going through a bunch of rituals, not putting on a spiritual performance to impress others. That's what we looked at last week, and, and the, the, the concluding part of those three spiritual habits, practices, disciplines was the practice of fasting. As I revealed last week, this is not a body that's done a lot of fasting. Uh, in some of the earlier days in Bible college, you know, so when you're really on fire for God and you're really spiritual, yes, me and some of my roommates and other friends from the college, we would, we would fast and we would try to be, you know, we would try to outdo one another, which I think was kind of against Jesus' point in the first place, but you really, you really can't teach young people at Bible college very much, at least at first. And over the years, fasting has been a discipline that I haven't put into practice. Fasting is abstaining from food intentionally, willfully, for a period of time so that you can focus on prayer and scripture reading and just developing a dependence upon God, not a dependence upon the things of this world. I am here to say that last Sunday will officially be the last Sunday I ever preach on fasting. Because out of that, two guys in the church challenged me to fast this week. I nearly died. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I didn't. It was actually a fantastic experience. Um, Jesus says, "Don't practice your religiosity before." Us. And I'm not doing that. I'm just, I'm just letting you know that that a couple of guys rose to the challenge. They challenged me to participate in a fast with them. Uh, we did that. We engaged in that. One of them was a 12-hour fast from noon Friday to noon Saturday. And you know what? It's doable. It's actually a pretty good, pretty cool experience, something that my spiritual life has been lacking over the last few years, and it's something I'm going to institute much more regularly. So it's a good thing. And yes, I will be preaching on it again at some point. Let's get into the, what our text is for today. Just a little bit of recap. The Sermon on the Mount is the greatest sermon, the greatest, you know, the greatest presentation ever given by any public speaker in the history of the world. The, the, the three chapters here in early Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, consolidate a, a, evidently a very long, probably an all-afternoon teaching session from Jesus to his disciples. It is the words in the Sermon on the Mount, and it is the in intent and the authority behind them that has set the tone. Modern ethical studies, which, yes, there are ethical studies, even by those who have no basis for, uh, for considering ethics whatsoever, they still contemplate these things, and the words of Jesus cannot be neglected. They cannot be pushed aside. They cannot be ignored because they are that important. This is the pinnacle of eth ethical teaching that the, the world has ever seen. So it's very important, very impressive. But we've got to make sure we make a very key distinction in this. All of these words, all of these things, Jesus is challenging people to believe and to live out and to put into practice. These are instructions to his disciples. A disciple is one who yields their autonomy over their own life and yields it to the authority of Jesus. And Jesus' disciples were those who had forsaken a life of self-direction and self-governance and instead yielded themselves to look to Jesus for how to think about God and how to think about the world, how to think about themselves, and to learn how to live life in a different way. 
than just obeying the law or going with the cultural trends or anything else. It's to looking to Jesus. This is to his disciples. And Jesus teaches his disciples, but there's also a significant crowd present as well. These instructions and these injunctions and these encouragements are not directed for the crowd. These are not to be enforced upon society at large. These are to be enforced upon those who are believers in Jesus, who are devoted to Jesus, who are followers of Jesus, disciples. This is what the life of a disciple truly looks like. This defines a lifestyle in obedience to him. Throughout the sermon, Jesus challenged his disciples to pursue a way of living that honors God, the Father, internally first. From the heart, a relationship. Not a duty, not an obligation, not a fear-based response, but instead a relationship of living with our Father who is in heaven. A way of living that honors God, the Father, internally rather than merely externally. A religion focused on rules, rituals, demonstrable behaviors. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches his disciples to reject legalism. Legalism is the idea that when we do righteous things, we are righteous. Righteousness comes from rule following. And oftentimes a person who is righteous in that view of themselves is what we call self-righteous because they have determined that they are righteous rather than letting God determine their righteousness. And self-righteous people tend to also be very judgmental and seek to impose their legal code for righteousness upon others. But Jesus says to reject that. Jesus says to reject religiosity. The idea that our righteousness comes through the rituals that we perform. Right at the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. If you do so, you will receive no reward from your Father who's in heaven. God wants the heart. That's where everything starts. The basic point of the Sermon on the Mount is to live with God as the audience for your life, not people. It's not living to impress. It's not living to put on a show. It's living solely in the understanding that when we live, the decisions we make, the habits we form, the the, the vocations that we do, everything of our lives is lived for an audience of one God himself. By the way, that's incredibly freeing. It completely separates you from from the the rat race and the, the pressures to conform and to perform for others. With God as the audience, Jesus says a number of times here in chapter six, your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And that's the key for true spirituality. Do the stuff in secret. And yes, eventually people are going to know, people are going to see, it's going to be visible and demonstrable. But start with practicing and performing your righteousness internally, focusing on loving God and knowing God and serving God and pleasing God alone. Here in the flow of chapter 6, Jesus, as I said, he dealt with three very, very typical, very visible spiritual practices that were very common in his day among the professional religious class, especially the Pharisees. Jesus starts off by saying these are the true habits, these are the true practices of one who is spiritual. You will give to those in need. You will give to the poor. But don't do it with a bunch of fanfare. Don't do it just for what you can get out of it. Don't do it just to make an impression. Don't do it just to feel good about yourselves and to assuage your own conscience. Do it because poor people need help, and this is what God wants you to do. God's plan for alleviating poverty is through those who are not impoverished but have the resources to give and to share. It's a key part of what keeps us and actually makes us human in the very best sense of the word. 
but the practicing of giving to the poor. Jesus moves on to prayer. And the Pharisees, the religious professionals of Jesus' day, they would stand on street corners and they would pray very loudly. They would pray very vocally. They would pray very elaborate, ornate prayers to, to show off their biblical knowledge and their, spiritual, their spirituality. They would put on a performance. Jesus says, when you pray, go home, go into the, to the closet, go into a small room, shut the door, don't tell anyone you're there and just go and pray and see what God does. And then he moved into fasting. Once again, the, the religious professionals, they fasted twice a week. The, the law of Moses only re required one fast per year, but the, the Pharisees fasted twice a week. And when they did, they would mark their faces with, with, with ash to show that they were kind of in a, in a way of mourning or that they were suffering. And they would go about the crowd. And the two days they chose to fast were the two primary days that the markets were open in villages and towns. So they would doll themselves up and then they would go to be seen by those buying food to feed their family for their daily sustenance. And there was probably the look of haughty derision. Oh, you poor people who have to eat. Don't you feel guilty? You should be spiritual like us. Jesus strictly, strictly condemned that. He said, when you fast, make it between you and God. Don't make any, don't make any alterations to your physical appearance. Don't whine about it. I must confess, I did whine a little bit <laughs> on a couple of occasions. The first fast was Wednesday. We, we, we skipped lunch. And uh, once again, this is a body that does not like to skip lunch. Did okay until about 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock is when the hunger pains and the hunger headaches kick in. The, the, the hangry time uh, comes. Um, but, you know, we, we, I weathered through it. But don't whine. I did whine a little bit, so I have to repent from that. Jesus moves from those spiritual practices that can be so physically demonstrable to others to something a lot more internal. He says, if you're practicing your spirituality from the heart, the, the heart is what you've got to deal with, and that's what our passage deals with today. There's two other spiritual practices, the, the true spiritual practices, beyond giving to the poor and praying and fasting. It's simply Serving God first and foremost. Serving God, not the idols of material possessions and monetary wealth. Jesus lays it out. That's pretty much the cosmic duel for our heart, God or money. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your heart follows. Your heart is intentionally uh, dispossessed towards those things you value the most, what we treasure the most, that which upon we place exceptional value. We are to treasure. We are to place exceptional value over our, on our relationship with God and the things that come from that over the things of the world. Jesus' disciples invest in heaven. Jesus merely points out that a focus on the things of this world and the money in this world is by its very nature fraught with anxiety and fear and worry. It goes into a whole, whole, whole host of other sins Greed, idolatry, lust, envy, desire for more, jealousy, all of those things. When that is the focus of our hearts, that becomes our God. And wealth is an unworthy rival God. After all, wealth is, in, is exceptionally fleeting, isn't it? How's your 401k doing? How's your IRA? What's your portfolio? 
What percentage is it down? I've stopped checking. It's too discouraging. Inflation is at, they say, 9%, most likely much more realistically 11 to 13%, and it's going to be getting worse. Headline this week is a number of governmental agencies are going to be releasing their economic reports and their economic forecasts. Some are saying it will be the worst week of President Biden's entire presidency with the news that's coming. Let not your hearts be troubled. But if your God is money, your heart is going to be troubled. (laughs) It's going to be troubled a lot. I don't think there's going to be enough antacids to take care of some of the things that we're already dealing with and are going to be dealing with. You see, placing faith, placing trust on material possessions or upon monetary wealth, it is a God designed to disappoint. It's an unworthy rival to God. Jesus here uses an illustration. He says, if your eyes are good, your eyes are going to see that which is light. It's going to let light into the body. But if your eyes are, are, are bad, if they're unhealthy, if they're faulty, there's only going to be darkness. And the darkness is going to infect your soul. And it's, a, it's a spiritual analogy. It's, 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 an, it's a concept of what are we putting our eyes on? What are we looking at? The, the Scriptures say to, to set our eyes on Jesus and look to Him as the, the beginner and the perfecter of our faith. But the scriptures also say that the, the, very first, um, the, the, fir- the very first step into sin is the lust of the eyes. When we place our eyes on something that we want, that we covet, that we desire, and then we obsess about that, that is the first step. The lust of the, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. So we've got to be careful what we set our eyes on. Here Jesus is is giving us a reprioritization for our desires. Don't desire money over God himself. How are we to view money? Well, a healthy, when when our eyes are working properly, they're healthy, we are going to view money in these terms, that it is only temporal that we really truly can't take it with us. That money is a blessing, but it's also a tool for generosity. Words of the Apostle Paul to his young apprentice, his disciple Timothy, he writes this, command those who are rich in this present world, hard stop. We may think, We're no Warren Buffett, we're no Bill Gates, we're no Elon Musk, we're not wealthy. Here's the reality. By the very nature of the food we have, the housing we have, the clothes we have, the resources we have, everything else we have, we are in the 1% compared to every human being who has lived ever on this planet. That's the scope of our wealth as people living here in the 21st century. We may not have a lot comparatively. Oh, we most likely don't have as much as we want. That's, that's always an issue. But just in comparison, our current generation is the wealthiest per capita generation that has ever existed on this planet, even with our 401ks taking a hit. We are the rich in this present world. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything. I think Paul kind of listened to Jesus. He provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, treasures in heaven. I love it when Paul and Jesus are on the same page. It's almost like they knew each other, and they kind of work together. They're on the same team. Good stuff. I joke about that because there's some theologians today who say Paul took the teachings of Jesus and twisted them into something completely different. Just gobbledygook. 
in idiocy, as most of that kind of stuff is. But Paul here is saying, those who have been blessed with wealth, that is us. We are to use it to do good in this world, to be generous. And by doing so, we will take hold of the life that is truly life. Uh, life that is truly life is not a life that, that simply earns to hoard and to keep Pursuing that level of security. A life that is truly life is a life that gives, that releases God's blessings back into the world. The analogy of a stream that goes to a pond and the pond keeps all the water and the stream that flows into the water does what? The, the pond becomes stagnant and when the pond is stagnant, what happens? All sorts of really gross stuff begins to grow on it. It's green, it's slimy, and it's icky. But a stream that continues to flow and goes into perhaps a lake and there's an outflow, that lake is fresh and clean and rejuvenating, continually giving, uh, getting life because it is giving life, metaphorically speaking. So that's what we're to do. That's a healthy way to view money. Use what God has given you, use it for His glory, bless others. But an unhealthy view of money, with faulty eyes, sees money and we only create more anxiousness for ourselves, we become greedy, covetous, stingy, idolatrous. And by the way, just one clear point, Jesus here is not telling His followers, not telling His disciples, don't save, don't invest, don't build wealth. He, he's not saying that per se. The Bible teaches that wealth from hard work and that wealth from wisdom is a blessing from God. In the Proverbs, we read that a good man, a righteous man, leaves an inheritance to his children's children. That means a a righteous man, a man following God, leaves an inheritance for his grandchildren. You got to have some wealth stored up to be able to do that. But there is an important perspective. Money is the main rival for our worship. Nothing captures the heart more than money and its associated issues. Money, when we worship it, that's what our heart truly treasures. And we've got to remember that money itself is not evil. Money is morally neutral. The Bible is often misquoted. The Apostle Paul is often misquoted. Money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's not what he says. It's not what the Word says. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love of money. If we serve, which means to worship, if we worship money, that is idolatry. And the natural byproduct of worshiping money will be anxiety. There was a wealthy multi-billionaire, I think it was one of the robber barons of centuries past. And I can't remember which one it was. I I should have looked this up because it's such an amazing quote. He was asked... How much is enough? And this is a man who had billions. How much is enough? And you know what he said? One dollar more. The one thing between the haves and the have-nots, the one thing in common, well, other than death, since everybody dies, the haves and the have-nots, always worry about money. They always want more. But if we serve, if we worship God and pursue righteousness, that alleviates our anxiety and gives us assurance. And that's spiritual practice number five. Four is serve God. Number five is trust God. Trust God by putting His kingdom first. 
the etymology of the word anxious. And anxious is such a weird word. You can be anxious and fearful. You can be anxious and excited. It it kind of describes that, that emotional response we have. But the word is from the Latin, and it means to choke, to strangle, to squeeze. And that's a pretty appropriate word, isn't it? When we are anxious, what, do we, what are we feeling? We feel like there's an elephant sitting on our chest. We can't breathe. We, we just feel the constraints around us because we're worrying. We're, we're, our world is closing in. We are being strangled. And it's kind of the same thing. If we're anxious, excited. Oh, I'm so excited I can't breathe. Same idea. But anxiety is mostly caused by fear. And most of the time, that fear is not real. It is imagined. Jesus says, do not be anxious. When I was serving at the church in Seattle, the Greenwood Christian Church, we had a very interesting gentleman who was attending services for a, for a short season. Um, a strange guy. Um, he definitely had some, some mental health issues. He would wear one of those like satin, satiny type of coats. Even when the weather was very, very warm, he'd wear this satiny coat. He would sit in the back row over on that side. So I'm not picking on you, Billy, but he would sit right about where Billy, Billy's sitting. And the entire time that Jim was preaching, Jim was the pastor there, and then he was the pastor here who preceded me. He would sit there and he would check his nails, he would look at his hands, and he would run his long fingernails against that satin coat. Constantly, I can't, I can't mimic it. The only worse sound from that in a church worship service is people clipping their fingernails, <laughs> which echo and reverberate and send chills down the spine. Fortunately, nobody's done that here for a long time, at least that I'm aware of. <laughs> but he would sit there with his arms folded, and he would just continually swipe at that satiny jacket and scrape his fingernails. Jim was preaching on this passage one weekend, and after the service, this man was very irate. He was very upset. He said, the preacher is a liar. He goes, it is impossible not to worry. He goes, I worry every day what I will eat, where my food will come from. And I says, well, Jesus is the one who said it, not just Jim. And then he says, Jesus is a liar. God's got good aim. I'm not worried about that. But no lightning came down. But that just struck me. For this man, yes, there was some, some worry in his life. And, and I, don't, I didn't know what to, how to hand answer him or how to really deal with that. These are tough words. Do not be anxious about anything. Do not worry about it. Of course we're going to worry. So is Jesus a liar? Is Jesus untrue? Is following Jesus and believing in Jesus and trusting in Jesus, is it too much for us? Because this seems pretty insurmountable. But maybe it takes a little bit more perspective. Jesus gives a couple of examples Talks about the, the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. And these are two just very simple examples from nature that negate the need to worry. Jesus uses the care of God for the birds of the air who don't do the things we do to create wealth and to produce our food and to store our food and all of that. But the birds are always taken care of. Not necessarily every single bird, because nature happens. But Jesus uses this as an illustration. The birds of the air, they're always there. They're always going to be taken care of. But you, you, oh child of God, are so much more valuable and important than the birds. And if God can make it so that they're taken care of, God can make it so that you will be taken care of. The flowers of the field, which if you ever look at even just a common flower growing up on the hillsides, and I'm not a botanist, I have no idea what they are, but I know some of them are exceptionally beautiful. 
And if you're hiking over at Prismo Preserve or some of the other places around here, and all of a sudden you see this little lone flower standing out in this field of just this dried, drought-sticking, you know, scrub everywhere, there's still a beautiful flower. And the, the beauty and the color, the intricacy is so incredible. And if God has designed that, if God has allowed for that plant to grow up in those circumstances, in that environment, and still flourish, God will take care of us as well. You see, God values us above all other life in His creation. And God knows what we need even before we ask but God does like it when we ask. Every good dad does. It's, it's actually, it's a good parenting technique. <laughs> if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, thanks for building my self-esteem, Jesus, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Jesus' solution for all this is to seek first the kingdom of God. Yes, there is plenty of things in the day today. There's plenty of things in the world to, yes, make us worry. But if we put God first, the worries will fade. The worries will dissipate. The worries will weaken. Seek first the kingdom and the righteousness it means to trust God and to ask Him for what you need. It means to align with His will in your conduct and your character, seeking His righteousness, seeking the righteousness He desires. Doing God's things in a godly way. Seeking first the kingdom of God means perhaps looking to the visible expression of the kingdom, which is the church and Christians for any necessary help. Sometimes that takes a lot of humility, but you know what? Humility seems to be the number one character quality that God not only desires, but rewards and as Christians, we are to be first and foremost in our willingness to help, our availability to help, and the actual giving of help as well. A couple of last points before we get to some application. It's important to realize, even in these things of not serving money but serving God and not, trust, or not, not taking the things of the world and becoming anxious but trusting God in the midst of that, Jesus says that an anxiety-free life is not necessarily a trouble-free life. Jesus said, every day is going to have enough trouble of its own. So just serving God and just trusting God is not the magical elixir that takes away the troubles of the world. We need to be reminded of that often, I think. Also this. Worry and worship cannot coexist. You cannot worry while worshiping, and you cannot worship while worrying. That is tweetable. For somebody with Twitter, it's not me. But it's such an important point. When we are worrying, what's a proper response? Start worshiping. Turn to God. Start praising. Start giving thanks. It reprioritizes, it resets the order of our mind, and it releases the heart from that anxiety and that fear. So start worshiping. We can also glean from this passage that worrying reveals little faith. And, and this is not an attack, this is not a, this is not a put down. It just shows that our faith has some room to grow. And that's why I want you to not worry about this. If you are overwhelmed with worry and perhaps it is crushing and it's, it's, it's squeezing and it's keeping your faith little, here's the good news. Faith can grow. Faith can get stronger. Faith can increase. That's what God's doing within us. It just takes some, some exercise. 
It takes a little bit of work. It takes some dedication. But faith can grow. And when it does, it becomes stronger. It's just like physical exercise. When we work out, we begin to build tolerances and gain endurance. With stamina, with, with cardio, or, or whether we're working out with weights, we, we break down the muscles and when we rebuild them, they get stronger and bigger. Faith is the same way. Just start exercising it. Start trusting and turn to God. A couple of application points. What treasure are you storing up in heaven? You can ask yourself, how am I investing for eternal significance? One hint, the answer can only be a who, not a what. The only thing from this life that goes with us into the next life, maybe not with us at the same time, but bear with me, are other people. That's why people are the priority. Second application question. Are you currently struggling with worry? A few follow-up questions. Is it what you are worrying about, is it truly worthy of worry? Really? Is it? If so, why is it? What steps will you take to give it to God? Will it be prayer? Will it be fasting? I can recommend that now from experience. Is it purging the desire, the desire to be in control? Is it the desire to be listened to, obeyed? Is it the desire to be taken care of? Is it the desire to simply be in comforts? Whatever it is. Will you, do you need some accountability? Share it with someone who will help you through it. If you're struggling with worry, do you need to ask for assistance? A fellow Christian or the church body, we aid, we assist, we help. We don't advertise that a lot, but we do a lot. Is it something else? Take some time, talk to God, think about it, listen to the Holy Spirit. You'll have a few moments as we prepare for communion. I'd like to have Mike and the guys come back up. In a few moments, we'll be having communion together. Communion is where we share together a small piece of bread and some juice. It represents the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and rising from the dead is what seals the deal of why we give him our allegiance why we wear the name Christian, why we consider ourselves disciples, why we look to him, why we take his teaching seriously. As Jesus took our sin, he set us free. As Jesus rose from the dead, he conquered our greatest enemy, death. Jesus is Lord, and in worship, that's what we acknowledge, the lordship of Jesus. Communion is open to all who have such a faith in Jesus that they are looking to him for not only eternal salvation, but life in the here and now as well. Use this time to examine yourself and to repent of your sin, to renew your faith, to rejoice in forgiveness, to reflect, to talk to God. I'd like everyone to please stand. And after we sing together, use this time to pray, meditate, worship, reflect, whatever it is. After we sing, after the song is done, simply come forward in a nice orderly fashion and pick up one of the communion sets on the tables here at the front. If you would prefer to remain standing or seated where you are, just raise your hand and communion will be served to you where you're at. And then we will share in communion together afterwards. Let's sing. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. 
Please come forward for communion. And if you would uh, please stand as we partake together. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, in remembrance of Jesus taking our sin in his body on the cross, we partake.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, in remembrance of a new relationship with God as Father, through faith in God the Son, we partake. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion is an individual act since Jesus died for the sins of each of us, but it is also a community act because we share in that salvation together. And it is good to affirm the corporate aspect of what act of worship we have just done. So if you would like, would you please recite along with me the words on the screens. In the act of communion together, we affirm our faith in the crucifixion of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. Together, we affirm our faith in the resurrection of Jesus for the gift of eternal life. And together, we declare our shared abiding hope of eternity with our Lord, the Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I forgot my notes. Was it last week when I tried to do the announcements without, without the cheat sheet? Yeah, we can't do that again. All right. As we uh, wrap up our time in gathered worship today, just a few announcements. Uh, please remember to fill out a connection card to let us know um, any spiritual decisions you've made or are contemplating making. We'd love to help you with that next step. Uh, for those who are watching online, there's an online version of that you can fill out as well. If you're a guest with us this morning, we're very honored that you're here. If you take a completed connection card to the Welcome Center, we have a special gift. We have some more information about the church. We also give you the opportunity to select um, a, one of the three agencies in town that deal with the homeless in our community. And because you're here today and because you turn in a card, we will make a donation in your name and in your honor to the agency of your choice, uh, People's Kitchen, Five Cities Christian Women, or Five Cities Homeless Coalition. Uh, Because you're here, because you're involved at Oak Park, you are involved in making a difference in the lives of those in need in our community. We're very excited about that. Uh, In the back of the row in front of you is a prayer card as well for praises or prayer requests. Uh, Please take advantage of that. And with connection cards and with prayer cards, you can put those in the offering boxes on the walls by the exits when you leave today. Uh, And Don't forget tithes, offerings, and gifts. Those are always greatly appreciated as well. And giving helps alleviate the anxiety we can have with money. All right. That's the only TV preacher thing you're going to get today on that. We do have a couple of big events coming up. Next Sunday uh, is a fifth Sunday, and we've reinstituted an older Oak Park tradition, fifth Sunday basically Fifth Sunday Fellowship dinners. So we have one next week. Uh, It'll be right after the service. There's some instructions uh, in the online bulletin for what to bring and how to participate in that. Uh, So we'll go from this service up to the fellowship hall next week, and uh, everyone is invited for that. And then for those who are newcomers to Oak Park, basically if you started coming to Oak Park like in the last three years, we haven't had like a newcomers class or a newcomers event for about three years, mostly because of COVID and other things that have happened. We're finally reinstituting that. We've got a lot of newer people that have come the last couple of years. And so we want to have dinner together, uh, introduce you to some different aspects of the church, some new people as well, and answer questions about what kind of church we are and how to get more involved and more plugged in. So um, if you are a newcomer, please know you are invited. We would love to have you here. You can sign up. Um, I think there's some instructions on the bulletin. All right, I think that's it for the major announcements. Would you please stand as we Oh, yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, Christian uh, concert night up at the Mid-State Fair. Mac Powell, the lead singer of Third Day, uh, he's going con- to be giving the concert. So great opportunity, fantastic voice, and a uh, very cool guy. He's got a great ministry as well. So that's Christian music. That's, that's uh, July 26th here in a couple of nights. And it's uh, free with fair admission for that. All right, would you please stand as we pray and as we wrap up with a song of praise and a prayer. Um, I will be available at the front uh, for prayer uh, if, you would, if you would like to receive prayer for something today. Father God, thank you for our time in gathered worship. As we go from this place, may we do so with our hearts and minds set more clearly and devotedly on you. 
Lord, may we earnestly seek to serve you, Lord God, and not our possessions, uh, which so often possess us, or money, which only brings anxiety. Lord, may we trust you for the things we need in this life, but Lord, mostly we trust you so that we can live for you and bring you glory as we love others on your behalf, as we give to those in need, as we care for those who are hurting. Lord, as we seek to practice our righteousness, not for the approval of others, but for your, for your honor and for the good of those we come in contact with. These things we pray in the name of Jesus.